All right. Um, to my uh, dear friend, President Nancy, to um, all the faculty and staff of this great seminary, I have friends who are here, students, the Turner Brothers, praise the Lord. Um, to all of you, I greet you in my master's joy. Uh, let us pray. Dear God, our holy Heavenly Father, we are your children come this far by faith, truly leaning and depending on the Lord. God, I ask that you get me out of your way and say a word to your children on this day. In the mighty, majestic name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Amen. I um, hear this Monday morning, and for most pastors, Preachers, you know this is our Sabbath. Um, I preached twice on yesterday. The latest one was at 8 o'clock, so I didn't get in too late and um, had to wake up early this morning. I hadn't woken up this early on a Monday morning since I was in school. Um, but I'm thankful to be here and thankful for the invitation. But I say all that to say I death. In the words of Elizabeth Taylor to her husband, I won't keep you long. Um, <laughs> if y'all don't get it, don't worry about it. Um, come with me to uh, our gospel according to John, chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is what God gave me just for you there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these things, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. But do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. Come by here today on my way to that new Jerusalem to talk for a moment about a theologian's trepidation. A theologian's trepidation. I, I had the opportunity as I studied to find a lot of different themes and topics and prayed about what it is that seminary students, faculty, and staff oftentimes deal with. And in my reading, I saw that the stress level of both seminary students, preachers, faculty, and administrators are at an all-time high. I found that as students who are dealing with their grades and dealing with their assignments, particularly in seminary, because seminary students are more likely than not to have families. 
seminary students are more likely than not to already have a job or a career. So you all, by virtue of your callings, are very, very busy. I, I pause for dramatic in, intent, but to say a simple word, you're busy. You, 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 you all don't have as much free time as, as most folks, or most graduate students who are solely in school full time. Um, you trying to get papers done, you trying to get your sermons done, and you have families, you have little ones at home, or you have grown ones that still call you thinking that you are their ATM and nowadays cash app. You, 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 you. When I was in school, I, my parents had to had to had to wire me money, uh, all this stuff. But now these children just can get theirs by cash app. I had to wait till mine came in the mail most of the time. Um, but these children get theirs by cash app, and so. There's a lot of trepidation. There's a lot of trepidation from the student side and from the administration side when, you're, when most of you have other jobs and most of you are trying to grade papers and, and keep families together and you're dealing with students who may be called but not yet refined. And you are trying to encourage them in their calling but at the same time refine the gifts because this is the only profession where you think, really, some folk, they don't need anybody to tell them how to do what God called them to do. God called me. I don't care what the professor says. <laughs> I, I don't need their proof. I know my sermon's good. I don't need, because God gave me every word, every line, every topic. But here we have, here we have this, this theologian, this man named Nicodemus, who, who was a Pharisee, who was a Pharisee, and I just lost a lot of weight, so a lot of my clergy collars don't fit me anymore. I thank God for losing weight, but it makes my collars feel a little awkward sometimes. Um, but Nicodemus was a, was a Pharisee, and he was a part of this sect of Jews that, that had mainstream theological thought. They believed in things such as the bodily resurrection. They, 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 they were the teachers of the law. In fact, historian Josephus said that the Pharisees were the most accurate exegetes of the law, that, 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 that they knew what they were talking about. But then you have this other rabbi who didn't go through the school of the Sanhedrin. You have this rabbi who, 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 who was a carpenter's son. You have this rabbi who comes along and he outteaches the teachers. You have a student in your class that knows your subject matter better than you. And there was a problem. And this theologian was stunned. These Pharisees were stunned. And so, and so one, 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 one instance is recorded in one theologian questioning Jesus, but the antithesis for this message today is how do we handle when you realize that you don't know everything but you were taught and you have degrees that show that you're supposed to you know I have degrees on my wall that says I went to school I have degrees on my wall that says I know something but what happens when there is something that you find out that you never even can this theologian's trepidation. What is it when you find out that, that oh, I really am a lifelong learner? What is it when you discover someone that didn't go through seminary, but they're in your Sunday school class and they know more about the Gospel of John? Uh, in my case, my grandmother, who was a seventh grade, who didn't have but a seventh grade education, knew more about, I'm still learning about the grace of God that she taught to me. And so, and so Nicodemus had this trepidation, and, and, and how did he do it? The first thing he did was, was, was he came to, to Jesus. And so this leads me to my thesis. I'm borrowing from the Hegelian method of dialectic preaching, and, 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 and it is that God is always ready to teach, but we, his children, must be ready to learn. And as we synthesize this, this title, this, 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 this antithesis and the thesis, we, we, we see the first thing that comes out is that 
Nicodemus had some nightly activity. Nicodemus went to Jesus. The Bible says this man came to Jesus by night. Why? Because he was busy in the day. Why? Because he didn't want to be seen with Jesus in the day. Why? Because he was a man of great stature and he didn't want people seeing him ask questions. Why do we wait to the end of the day to seek Jesus? Why do we wait till we spent all of our energy in the day doing everything God knows what? But once we get to the twilight of our life, why do we say, oh, I guess now I need to talk to the Lord? Hold that. Why do we not want to be seen with Jesus in the day? Preachers don't want folks knowing they're preachers. I know because I've been there. You, 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 you don't even tell them what you do for a living. Uh, I, I, I remember one time I was on an airplane, uh, and I was sitting next to uh, somebody, and I was just talking to them, and, 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 and they, they didn't know who I was. I didn't know who they were. And um, we began to talk about where they were going. They were going to Atlanta, and I was coming to Tulsa. And I... Um, you know, so what do you do? Well, I consult, you know, and I do consult. And I said, what do you do? And I, well, I, I write, and, I, and I, I, I kinda, I'm a journalist. And, um, we, and I end up asking some more questions. Found out I was sitting next to, on the plane, Andrea Mitchell from MSNBC. And she found out she was sitting next to a pastor from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it just was so funny that the both of us were very vague <laughs> in who we were. You know, she, 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 she was vague about who she was. She said, I'm just a little journalist. I was like, okay. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just a little speaker. <laughs> and, and, and she and I still, we were still like, I don't say we're friends, but we still communicate. And it's so funny how God just introduces you to people. But it's amazing how... Sometimes we don't want people to know who we are. You know, why, why did Nicodemus wait till the evening to talk to Jesus? Why do, we, why do we hide those folk who we're closest to? Or sometimes, when before I was a preacher, you know, I didn't always live a, a color lifestyle. And... Um, there are things that there, there are people that you call only at certain times of night. Help me out, somebody. You know, I, I, I ain't the only. There, there are certain people that you call for certain things at, at night. And, and, and why is it that these are the people that choose you pretty close to? But in the daytime, you barely even speak. He's like, you see you, I see you, you see me. We may not, may not even nod. But you best believe by 10, 11 o'clock at night. Okay. And so, why do we do God like that? Think about that. God ain't your booty call. I'm sorry, did I say that? We live streaming. Oh, my. Okay. But, but he, 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 he shouldn't be. He, 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 he should be somebody that you should be seen with. I'm just trying to make it plain. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just you know. Uh, uh, he, he should be somebody that you, uh, that you don't mind being seen with. We ought to stop pimping Jesus, only coming to him when it's convenient for us. And once he gives us what we need, we're gone. We may not even call in the morning. We're just gone. But that's how Nicodemus treated Jesus. But also, but also, but also another, another possible alternative. Um, as theologians, we have to look at both sides. Another possible reason for Jesus calling, Nicodemus calling Jesus at night is because in the daytime he was too busy to devote full attention. Right? 
I know that sounds, sounds like some good game, but it could be true. You know, I'm calling you this late because I'm, in the daytime, I can't devote as much time. But at night, I want to spend all of my time with you, and I can't do that in the day. Preachers, what is your nightly activity? What do you do when nobody is looking? Nicodemus' nightly activity, though it was at night, at least his nightly activity was spending time with the Lord. What do you do when you're by yourself? I have students, I teach, and I know that every night they're on their laptops, they're not working on papers. <laughs> they, every night they're on laptops, they're not doing their homework assignments. What do you do at night? I can tell by, by, by reading their papers. And you, spent, you say you spent all night on this paper? What were you really doing on your laptop at 2 in the morning? And those are the type of questions that even though we can get upset at Nicodemus, at least he talked to Jesus at night. I could, have think, I could think of far worse people he could be entertaining. The next thing is that, well, if you notice about this exchange, is that Jesus, when he answered him in verse 3, he said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <laughs> I laughed when I read that because nowhere in verse 2 did Nicodemus ask about the kingdom of God. Exegete the text, preachers. He, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, and for no one can do these things, can no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus responds, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What are you, what are you talking about, Jesus? Nicodemus didn't ask anything about the kingdom of God, but Jesus answered with that. And it led me to believe and God spoke to me and said Jesus never minds your question he still gives you the answer. There, there are questions that you have asked God and God you think that God has to answer your question. No, God has to give you the answer. Oftentimes, the trepidation of theologians, students, faculty, is Jesus answers questions that we never even ask. There are blessings in your life that God has given you that you didn't even ask for. There are things that you are asking for that God has yet to do, but meanwhile, he has given you things that you never even thought to ask for. Case in, some of the best blessings we never asked for. We are alive today. How many of us asked our parents to be born? Some of the best, if you survey your life, give yourself a spiritual autobiography, some of the biggest blessings in life you didn't ask for, but God gave. I'm from Alabama. I said stressing, Alabama. That's how we say it. Alabama. I've never prayed a prayer in my life to come to Oklahoma. Never. I, not one time in my life did I pray to God, Lord, send me <laughs> to Oklahoma. Never on my prayer list. But look at God. And I'm in the great state of Oklahoma. The best blessing. Some of you didn't ask for the children you have. You just had a late night call one day and nine months later, there it is. But your child is a blessing. Some of the jobs that you have, you didn't even apply for. I'm telling you what God loved, the truth. Some of the best jobs I've had, I ain't never applied for. Somebody said, you know what? Would you be interested? I'm like, you know, I, I wouldn't, but since you mentioned it, 
But that's how God did Nicodemus. Nicodemus didn't ask about the kingdom of heaven, but Jesus looks beyond what we ask and sees what we really need to know. And so what we need to do always as Christians is have our and spiritual antennas up that we can receive what God is trying to impart upon us. And when we pray, have a moment in our prayer for listening for the answers to questions, even if we didn't ask them. That is why reading your Bible is so important. That is why even in class, there, there may be questions that you don't ask, but somebody else asks, you ought to listen to them because the answer to them could help and benefit you. We are blessed in so many ways. We have these things called involuntary muscles, muscles that we don't control, but they operate anyway on our behalf. Now, one of us is asking our heart to beat right now. Now, one of us is are asking our lungs to exhale or inhale. Now, one of us is saying, send blood throughout my body. Now, one of us is telling the nerves in our bodies to be alert and on guard. Now, one of us, not one of us sending neurons throughout our brain that we can remember even what I'm saying. But that's what God does. He gives us things that we don't even know to ask for. And the humility of Nicodemus is shown by him being willing to listen to the answers to questions that he didn't even ask. If Nicodemus were some of us, and Jesus replied to him with an answer that he didn't even want to know, or he didn't even ask, we would have, man, you crazy. I ain't got time for you. But he sat there and listened because even though he didn't ask the question, Nicodemus knew he needed the answer. And the last and final point is that Nicodemus' amazement can show us the benefit of trusting God. His amazement was seen when Jesus told him how you can be born again, how you know that which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. And Jesus says all of these things to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus, the Bible says in verse 9, had great amazement, saying, how can these things be? See, when you begin to trust more and question less, your life will be filled with amazement, going back to the child analogy, when I had my baby boy with my wife, she heard me say that she would be upset, when my wife had my baby boys and when I saw them come into this world, she, she, she allowed me to spend a lot of moments with them because she was needing her rest. And it was amazing to see the first time they felt cold water, the first time they, they drank milk. The first time they, they had applesauce and just the expressions on their face, things they never asked for. But, 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 but to see the expression when they, when they had, when they had uh, yogurt for the first time. And, and, and sometimes in life, we can get so used to things, but we fail to realize that every day is a miracle and every day is a new opportunity to experience life in a different way, and you see that amazement the most in children, in, in babies, the first time that my children learn how to walk. It was the moment I would never forget that a baby that has been used to being carried or crawling on all fours, finally standing up on the corner of a couch and taking their first wobbly steps and realizing that they can do it. That same amazement I saw and felt when I read Nicodemus when he said, how, how can these things be? Let's, it's, it's, you know, how, 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 can, how can this knowledge be so full? How can life be so good? How can this experience be so splendid? How can these things be that I can be a 40-plus-year-old man but still be born again and not having to enter back into my mother's womb and, and, and I can just be born again by the Spirit, every day in class, should have, you should have those amazement moments of how can these things be. Every moment you read your book or study, your notes, your learning should be a moment of amazement, a continuous journey of amazement. How 
can these things be? How can we understand? And, and, and so then your trepidation should turn to amazement and, and, and you begin to thank God for what he has imparted into your mind. But notice, what did Jesus say after Nicodemus' amazement? He didn't say, I told you I could do this. He said, he kind of got, Jesus was not the most uh, uh, nurturing teacher, uh, for lack of a better word. He, he, he would get ones on his evaluations. Uh, he, he, would, he, he would be the class you would not want to take again. Uh, he, he says, because after Nicodemus is saying, how can these things be? Jesus said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know this? I mean, can you imagine teachers, your students coming to you? Oh, man, this is amazing what I learned last night. I found out about, about St. Augustine and his theories. And, and, I said, I found, and, and you're like, well, you should have. That's why I signed it. You know, aren't you a preacher? And I'm like, not, not even a pat on the back, not even an encouragement. And so that's to let you know, student that even the best professor, Jesus, he, 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 he did not do the nurturing that you think you ought to have. Your nurturing is you getting the grade. Your nurturing really is you getting the knowledge. That's, that's, that's what Jesus, he, he, he could care less about, about how, how well you felt in getting it, but he just wanted to make sure you got it. And, 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 and sometimes we get too caught up in our feelings with, I don't think my professor likes me. Well, is he or she teaching you? Forget whether or not they like you. Are they teaching you what you need to know? And if they are, wonderful. You don't, Jesus, you think he really cared if folks liked him or not? No. Obviously, they didn't like him because they killed him. <laughs> you know, he was, now, and teachers, I don't care how bad your students are, at least they're not trying to kill you. I hope. You know? <laughs> but, 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 but Jesus said, but you, you a teacher of the law. You, you should know these things. And, and, and so sometimes we have to be humble even when we learn. We have to be humble and, 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 and we have to know that the Nicodemuses of our life, that as you become the theologian God is calling you to be, as you have your night moments with the Lord, as you have your questions answered that you did not even ask, don't despise humble beginnings. Don't despise your late night conversations with God. Don't despise the questions that you didn't ask but became answered. Don't, don't, don't despise that because were it not for Nicodemus, Asking Jesus, were it not for Nicodemus questioning Jesus, were it not for Nicodemus standing there, actually, uh, some would say being humiliated by Jesus, we would have never, that, that, and that took place in John chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. Were it not for Nicodemus doing that, we would have never gotten one of the most popular, famous scriptures in all of Christendom, which is John three sixteen. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus when he said, for God so Love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You never know the byproducts of the conversations that you have with people who are seeking knowledge. You never know the consequence of you taking time out of your night, Jesus, to talk to somebody who was too embarrassed or too busy to talk to you in the daytime. You, 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 you never know, Jesus. You, 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 you never know. And, and, and because of that, we have the most popular scripture we've ever had. Because Jesus took the time to teach somebody that came to him after office hours. Yeah, my office hours are from, I'm talking about five heartbeats now if y'all seen that movie. My office hours are from 9 to 5. But Nicodemus came out the office hours. And the teacher still saw him. Sometimes we can be too quick to close our office, not respond to our email. Jesus was busy. He was tired. 
But he still took the time. And because he took the time, we have the most rich scripture verse in all of Christendom. For God so loved the world. And because Jesus took the time with Nicodemus, when Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin council, you know the story. Nicodemus was one of the only ones that spoke up and said, let Jesus speak. When they were spitting in his face, when they were slapping him, when the priests were tearing their robes, Nicodemus, because he had this late night conversation with Jesus and Jesus opened up his eyes, Nicodemus was one of the only Pharisees that spoke up in their room and said, let Jesus speak. And Nicodemus had to be a little frustrated when all Jesus said was, it is so. That what you said is so. He didn't take up for himself. He's like, this is the same Jesus that told me off a few nights ago. This is the Jesus. Tell them off. I know you got the answer to everything that they're saying. I know you can respond to every accusation. You, 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 you humiliated me on the streets of Galilee. Tell these folk off. Tell them what you told me. And Jesus basically didn't say a mumbling word. And Nicodemus probably was like, what's wrong with you? I know you know the answers to this. I know that you can say everything and humiliate them and embarrass them. But Jesus just sat there and took it. And Nicodemus probably watched Jesus be beaten by the Roman soldiers. Nicodemus probably watched Jesus be put the crown of thorns on his head. Nicodemus probably watched Jesus uh, uh, as, the, as the crowd chose Barabbas over him. I, Nicodemus was standing there the whole time probably like, why, why don't he just say what he told me? Why, why didn't he just come for? Why, why, why is he so quiet? Why is he so silent? Why is he allowing this stuff to happen to him? He is Jesus. He is the rabbi. He knows the answer. He is never at a loss of words. And then when Nicodemus saw Jesus carrying that cross of Golgotha's hill. I can imagine him saying, what is going on? What, what is happening? I, I cannot believe my eyes. And when Nicodemus saw Jesus up on that cross, as he was being nailed to that cross by his feet being put together and, and putting a nail through one foot, then the other foot, then the wooden cross, then his hands being outstretched and the nail going through one arm and then the nail going through the other arm. I can imagine Nicodemus saying, this cannot be happening. I, I know that first of all, he is innocent. And second of all, he can tell everybody off. And why is Jesus not saying something? What happened to this very confident teacher that I had? What happened to this mighty man of God that I know? And when Jesus died, the reason why I know Nicodemus was there, because the Bible says that Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea got his body off the cross. So they were there watching in amazement like, why is he just suffering? Nicodemus was so influenced by Jesus that he got Joseph Arimathea to give him a place to bury him. Nicodemus carried almost 100 pounds of myrrh. That is worth a lot of money just to embalm the body of Jesus. This Nicodemus once was a student of Jesus, once was a teacher, then became a student. That's a sermon by itself. Once a teacher, then became a student, and lastly became a follower because he watched his teacher suffer. And sometimes in life, teachers, it's important for us to have all the answers, but also sometimes in life, it's important for our students to see our vulnerability. It's important for them to see, yes, we are human too. One thing I try to do as a pastor is never allow my congregation to put me high up on a pedestal. Because sometimes they'll just watch you fall. And secondly, because they need to see that we struggle. They may not even know how we struggle. They need to know. And Jesus showed Nicodemus 
that, yeah, I got all the answers. Yes, I can say anything. Yes, I can respond to all this. But there's a time in your life where you need to be silent. And Jesus was silent. Jesus took that punishment for Nicodemus. So if you can imagine Nicodemus saying, Jesus, why don't you say something? Nick, Jesus, why don't you do something? And Jesus is like, I am. <laughs> Y'all missed that. Jesus, Nicodemus thinking, why don't you do something? Why don't you say something? And Jesus is thinking in his head, because he can read his thoughts, Nicodemus, I am doing something. By me suffering. By me dying. By me being humiliated in front of the Sanhedrin Council, I am doing the best thing for you as my student that I possibly can. And so sometimes what your teacher does, students, may seem strange. It may seem like it doesn't make sense. But they are doing something. And sometimes teachers, your students that you think are the most un... <laughs> Un, whatever un you want to put it there, will be the main ones that when the world crucifies you, they'll come take you off your cross. When the world betrays you, it may be the student that you never even thought would ever do something for you. But as Nicodemus did for Jesus, came and took him off the cross, paid for his burial expenses, to be embalmed. And because of that story, we have the greatest scripture verse we've ever had. For God so loved the world. And I come by to let you know you can take your theologian's trepidation and God can turn them into his glorification. God bless you and God keep you.